Good morning. So I'm going to talk about uh, the austerity trap. And, and, more pres and, and I'm, not going to, I'm going to talk more about austerity than about inflation, because I think the problem now is growth. As I'm going to talk about austerity and growth. And I'm going to try to talk about austerity and growth in a context where you don't really have access or have decided not to use uh, the exchange rate as um, an adjustment mechanism. And I, I will say, first of all, that I come to this as a practitioner. Not, it's not an area that I have done a lot of research in. Uh, I would just like to introduce to you sort of a case study, uh, some empirical observations, and, and to stimulate um, the discussion. And it's very much in the spirit, uh, one of the reasons that I'm um, keen to support INET is that it's reinforcing this trend to, to exploit a larger, a broader set of, of uh, international experience uh, in, in um, economic work. So, so um, to, to start, Europe is, at least parts of Europe, is caught in this austerity trap. It's, it's sort of a combination of some sort of long-term desirable effects or trends that in the short term are having a very negative impact uh, on, uh, on growth in particular. So households are saving more. We want them to save more. They are deleveraging. Financial institutions are deleveraging, also desirable, but it's also having an impact on the supply of credit. Governments need to reduce their debt, they need to get their fiscal uh, houses in order, and um, it is particularly in the periphery, but also elsewhere. And all these trends have um, spillovers for other countries, and uh, spillovers through net exports. So what we see, particularly in the periphery, I'm talking now about the southern periphery primarily, we see a vicious uh, downward spiral and of the evidence that we thought or was claimed of, of a sort of austerity-induced growth in the short term, I think there is very little uh, that supports that. And um, what the periphery needs is um, outside capital to generate growth, and I'll come back to that uh, at the end. So, so I'm going to try to give you a lesson from, from one part of the European periphery uh, to, to another. So, the lessons are for the southern periphery, and I'm going to look at the experience of the Baltic states. So the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they had a crisis of a very similar origin, just a much more severe crisis. There was a foreign finance boom that led to the world's deepest recessions. The output dip created very high unemployment. I'll show you some numbers in a moment. So the question is, you know, what may have worked? I think it's way too early to, to give any definitive answers to this. There was a draconian, I mean draconian, I'll show you some figures of that too, a government austerity program that restored confidence. There were severe internal devaluations that helped the competitiveness. And there was an sort of exemplary business environment that facilitated a, a rebound. So the big question is, what could have made this possible, assuming that this is uh, really the, the, um, what we'll see uh, going forward as well. So I'm, I'll speculate, I'll put up a few possible explanations and, and then uh, let you uh, be judged. So quickly, as I said, similar origins, booms that funded by foreign capital, the, um, this is showing uh, the average 2006 and two, uh, 2008, and and the average 2009 and, and the most recent measure. And you can see that uh, actually uh, the current account uh, deficits were even larger in the Baltics than in, than in the southern periphery. This turn, and, and strong growth, growth actually, the, the light blue here is, is the Baltic. So in, in five years, they increased uh, GDP, real GDP, by 50%. And then they dropped by uh, more than 20% in two years. And they had a draconian uh, austerity program 
These are um, uh, discretionary consolidation measures uh, as estimated by the European Commission. And you can see particularly Latvia had something like uh, in 2009, something like 9% uh, in combined revenue and expenditure uh, measures. And in Latvia, the health and education reforms were about one third cut in, in both health expenditures and education expenditure. And, and these were 61% of the total. So we really talking about closing down hospitals, closing down schools, and, and so on. Social protection increased, but it's still very tiny. And uh, the real um, uh, measure that came into force, this was a commitment to pension reform and, and increased pensions that sort of helped go the other way uh, to, to uh, increase uh, uh, support uh, for, particularly for socially uh, exposed groups. And there were well-targeted uh, public works programs. And um, here's the effect on uh, nominal labor costs. And you can see that the light blue line again, that was a, a very significant internal devaluation. And, and that combined with a, a secular improvement uh, of the quality of, of exports. And that's something that you know, remarkably was basically unaffected by the uh, crisis. So this secular trend that you see since the beginning of the 2000 uh, continued throughout the crisis. And together they helped uh, Baltic exports. I don't know what happened here, but they're supposed to start from 2006 at 100. But you see the, the general pattern, uh, a, a dram dramatic fall in, in net exports that then turns around in, in about 2007. So the Baltic states were a little bit ahead because the Swedish banks saw what was happening and they started cutting down on uh, credit to uh, the Baltic states a bit earlier. So the bottom is somewhere uh, in the, the first, uh, second quarter, 2007, and then uh, a, you know, quite a, a dramatic uh, rebound of exports. And this helped lower unemployment. You see unemployment goes from you know, quite a low level, 5%, reaches 20% and then starts coming down. And um, you can argue that it actually s restored a sustainable growth path. So if you look at um, yeah, just one number here, um, if you look at the, the, where they are today compared to the early 2000s, they had throughout that period an average uh, growth of 5.1% per year. So assuming that this trend continues, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, a bad record. And, and this they did, despite all these claims of being such flexible uh, labor markets, is actually not uh, uh, true. Uh, they are sort of in the middle somewhere uh, in terms of flexibility. And, um, but what was really different was the, the business environment. This is just uh, you know, one of many measures you can have, but this is the, the, the ease of doing business uh, ranking. And you can see that they all do you know, much better than the southern periphery. And that's going to be important, of course, when you try to attract uh, foreign capital in particular. So, so why did it work in the Baltics? Uh, and I emphasize here so far. Well, these are small open economies. You say, OK, you know, what, what can we learn from that? But you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that size is an important uh, factor when you try to do reforms. I, I, I think you can make uh, opposite arguments as well. Yes, they were probably in a more benign environment, particularly uh, from sort of Q3 2009, when the Scandinavia in general started picking up after also having actually quite a, a deep dip in, in the beginning of the 2009. The political economy may be different from, from what we see in the southern periphery, but it's also very different among these different Baltic states. So Estonia and Latvia couldn't be more different. Of course, they have a joint Soviet heritage, but Estonia had a sort of clean slate with uh, uh, its uh, oligarchic structures and, and, and Soviet past, while Latvia has a much more oligarchic structure, very volatile uh, politics, and um, this is actually the first government that was re-elected, really, um, uh, that the one that came, uh, was re-elected in the midst of the crisis and after the, actually the, the most uh, difficult measures were taken. So political economy may be different, but it doesn't seem like this is certainly something that combines this uh, country. Implementation, well, I think there was a very important aspect to how this was implemented. So there was a lot of emphasis on, on again, draconian uh, expenditure cuts. I think when you look at them, actually what they represented was a lot about, close, was a lot about closing down 
hard, hardware, closing down schools, uh, closing down hospitals, but actually uh, making it more efficient. But ne definitely it's too early to say what the long-term impact of these measures are. But what they really did was to have uh, expanded uh, safety nets. So for those most uh, vulnerable, the, they really expanded, uh, particularly in Latvia, uh, uh, quite significantly. W one thing that strikes me when I look at it at least is that the role of the constitutional court in, in Latvia, for example, that this was a, a sort of safety valve that people used to challenge these measures and gave them a certain legitimacy and it was a constraint, but it was, a, a, I think, in the long term, a healthy constraint. You can say, you know, people say the crisis was so deep, so you know, the, the, the sense of urgency was there. But as we all know, I mean, depth of crisis can also be very limiting in terms of what you can do to, to, to respond. And um, so, yes, it could. I would say one thing that really was important and, and sort of stands out was the recency of previous crisis experience and also the brevity of the boom. So there was sort of a, a real, I say, this happened all very quickly and there was something surreal about it in people's mind. But also the recency of, of crisis experience, maybe I should go here first. So here is the output drop in 2008 to, to, to your left and to your right the um, output drop that they saw in, in the 1990s. So here there was a, sort of a an exper recent uh, crisis experience that maybe made this, this experience uh, more you know, palatable, palatable and um, where you, know, you haven't seen uh, riots in the streets like you've seen in the southern periphery. This could be an, an, one, one explanation. And, and we see also, if you look at life satisfaction, so we tried to measure this uh, in 2006 and 2010, and you see that actually life satisfaction only is affected very marginally uh, by the crisis, while if you look at Western Europe, the impact is, is very dramatic on, on life satisfaction. Let me just say one more thing, because I don't want to claim that this does not have lasting impact. We can see here that uh, this is support for democracy that has fallen between 2006 and 2010. We do a, a survey every four years of, of a household survey and, and perception survey, and this is just one measure, life uh, uh, support for, for democracy. You take here, uh, the same thing happened with the support for, for markets. So this happened in this country, but it actually happened also in other countries in, in Eastern Europe, and in, in, in Central Europe in particular. So Poland, for example, also. So in Hungary, as we know, this is, has been the case. So let me, um, I, yes, I haven't talked anything about external pressure, because there was, of course, a lot, of, particularly in Latvia's case, Latvia was under an IMF EU program, and a lot of involvement also from uh, uh, Swedish interest, for example, because uh, Sweden contributed to the, to the program and was on courts, the Swedish banks were important. So external pressures were probably, on the balance, helpful and maybe more legitimate than they are in, 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 in southern uh, Europe, but they were also patronizing and, and often counterproductive. I think here, I just, as I was preparing this, I, I uh, caught um, this slide caught my mind, uh, sort of Pinocchio only turns into a real person when he permanently changes his attitude and behavior from a European Commission presentation on, on Latvia in, in February this year. So, you know, I think these are not helpful um, um, notions. So, so, so I said one important di difference between the Baltic states and the southern periphery um, are um, the uh, business environment. So what can you do if you don't have uh, the good business environment. Well, I think the, 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 what you need is what I would call governance-heavy capital. So you, you need for outside capital, because we saw these uh, reinforcing uh, trends that create this austerity trap. And um, that was what generated growth in the first place, and that's what's going to need to generate growth uh, now. To, re to restore it in the periphery, it must return, because it has to replace the weak domestic demand. But to get this kind of capital in, you need to have, uh, it needs to be very governance heavy, either foreign direct investment, or if it's official capital, it needs to be long term, and it needs to be uh, what I call governance heavy. So it has to be a lot of conditionality, but it should be at the project level, at the sector level, probably not so much at the economy level. And it needs to be capital that crowds in, brings in the private sector, uh, that supports markets, and uh, there are some recent principles that have been part of developing for 
uh, multilateral development banks that can be helpful in you know, what type of, of measures are, are useful here. So, le so let me um, summarize. Uh, yes, in the Baltic states, uh, this internal devaluation and fiscal austerity worked, at least so far. Yes, the initial conditions were different, but I would argue from what I've seen, and, and, and again, you may have other uh, factors that um, you want to emphasize, but uh, it doesn't seem to be that different. And, and what was very important, and, and I think what is, of course, now being tried in the southern periphery are these sort of free reforms, you know, enabling business, uh, cutting red tape, uh, and so on. And this is clearly what's the main difference between the southern periphery and, and the Baltics. And in the meantime, wh while these reforms are having an impact, we need uh, this type of governance-heavy capital and capital that crowds in the private capital and reinforced market. Thank you very much.